Hey guys, it's Quinn. Terry taking a look at the last film of the 60s to feature Sean Connery, and D was planned to be his last Bond film altogether. You only live twice. Now to give some backstory, Sean Connery and Harry Salzman, who is the other producer alongside Albert Broccoli until The Spy Who Loved Me, were starting to get into some friction during and after Thunderball. So by the time You Only Live Twice came around, the two had such distaste for each other that whenever Salzman entered the set while shooting, Connery would just stop acting. The friction became so much that after this film, Connery left the role, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. So how does the last film and undoubtedly the best era of the series hold up? Well, let's find out with 1967's You Only Live Twice. So after by far the best gun barrel so far, we are in space. No, not quite Moonraker yet, people. We then see an American spaceship almost eaten by another ship. And no, not the spy who loved me yet either. I just want to point out here, though, the score for this movie is awesome and really makes everything just more exciting, just like the spaceship scene we just saw. We then cut to this weird glow building where we see the good old U.S. yelling at Russia, but England is there to keep everyone in check. It is said if the next U.S. ship is stolen, then war will occur with them and Russia. We then cut to Japan where we see Bond doing his business when he is abruptly shot. Now, I know I've said this many times that I hate when they kill Bond in the pre-title because it doesn't feel real. I'm looking at you, Thunderball. But I really enjoy this one here. It makes the whole film feel more dangerous for Bond, seeing that he could be killed off so quickly. Anyways, the police arrive, we see Bond in a pool of blood, and we are off into the title sequence. So after a really nice theme by Nancy Sinatra, which I think is one of the best pure songs in the series, we see Bond's burial at sea. One thing I do want to point out, which I think is interesting, we see during the credits that Roald Dahl is the screenwriter for this film. At least I thought it was interesting. Anyways, we see Bond being sent off when a submarine picks him up. It turns out the assassination was fake so that it would be easier for Bond to hunt down Blofeld. Bond then goes to Tokyo where he meets his contact at a sumo wrestling fight. Bond declares his love for the contact as she leads him to Henderson. Henderson is built up to be a really nice- Ah! It's Blofeld. Quick, Bond, shoot him while you can. Anyways, after a really nice scene between the two, which ends with a rather creepy death by knife. Like, seriously, Henderson just stops talking mid-sentence. Bond hunts down the killer and follows the driver to Osato, which will probably be the Zorn Industries of this film. After a fight between the driver and Bond, the contact, whose name is Aki, picks up Bond from Osato. Then there's this really random scene of Aki running away from Bond and then basically capturing him. I really don't like it because they're trying to add a mystery to her that just isn't necessary. I don't care really about her at this point, so making her out to be a bad character just confuses me more than interests me. But Bond does meet a much more likable character whose name is Tiger. After some snooping and some photographs, they go to Tiger's house. There they discuss the possibility of a foreign power or organization, such as Spectre, being the ones responsible for the stolen spaceships. But then, another scene happens with Aki that drives me nuts. So what happens is that Bond chooses a girl to massage him, and halfway through the lady leaves and Aki comes. All well and good, right? But when Aki comes, she kisses him, and Bond says, Aki, in a way that someone would say a name to a long-lost friend. It just doesn't feel right and kind of makes the scene unbelievable. The next day, Bond goes over to Osato. Again. Doesn't see if that wise, does it, Mr. Bond? We basically find out here that everyone there is really sketchy. Like, the main guy basically just x-rays Bond. That's not really a good sport, is it? As soon as Bond leaves, an order is sent out for Bond to be killed, and after a pretty cool car chase, Bond messages Tiger, who tells Bond that he should go to a port to check out a mysterious boat. And after lots of action, Bond is captured by the business guy. After a little bit of interrogation, Bond gets the girl for some reason. Like, actually, she just starts to kiss him. Anyways, he convinces her to escape with him to Europe. Oh, God, I'm getting a big whiff of From Russia with Love right now. Anyways, she screws Bond over, and Bond, with no emotion at all, like, seriously, at all, Connery has no expression on his face while this is happening. Bond escapes the plane. My boy Q then comes, and after a really great scene where little Nelly is introduced, Bond is off to go and try to find... stuff? 
things, excitement. I'm sorry, but I find it hilarious that little Nelly is like three feet long and flies like a champ. Anyways, after a really cool helicopter fight, which features good use of the Bond theme, we cut to a Russian space launch, and you guessed it, the spaceship is stolen. As the space thing lands, we find out that the volcano that Bond skimmed over earlier is where all the action is going down. The best part of this entire sequence, though, is the amazing set under the volcano. Not only is it impressive as the likes of Fort Knox and Goldfinger and the shuttle and Moonraker, but the set costs more than the entire production of Dr. No. Yeah, impressive. That is over $1.1 million. It is in the volcano, though, that we find out that Spectre and Blofeld are the masterminds of this whole operation. Shocker, I know. Just to be clear, the entire plan is to keep stealing American and Russian space shuttles to start a war. But why go through all of that? Well, it's Spectre, so yeah. We then cut to a scene with a bridge with no rails with piranhas under it. Well, I guess there is nothing wrong with that. So yeah, number 11's killed, and the reason she's killed is because she didn't kill Bond. Is anyone getting a whiff of From Rush With Love right now? We then cut to Bond, who decides to turn Japanese to not look suspicious. I repeat, to not look suspicious. Keep in mind that Sean Connery is over 6 feet tall. In order to do so, Bond gets a makeover in this weird Tim Burton-like room. And after we see a group of native Japanese women speak English to each other, Bond is officially Japanese. Aki then gets killed, which really makes no sense for where the movie was, and I think is one of the major problems with this movie, is her entire character, like, how she's dealt with. But anyways, she's killed, Bon is officially Japanese, and now he must begin his training. Cue 80s movie montage. <laughs> Okay then, Bond then gets married. God, he forgot about Aki real quick. It's only been like two days. So Bond is now a Japanese fisherman. Well, God, I'm biting my nails just thinking about it right now. Anyways, the President of the United States is given a final warning to Russia, and the next space launch will happen in 24 hours. So Bond, after hearing of a death of a woman going into a cave area, decides to investigate. He finds toxic gas and decides that it must be an outlet to the volcano we saw earlier, which is conveniently only a few miles away. Good job, writers, making the job easier for our hero. After seeing a helicopter going into the volcano, they decide to raid the volcano, realizing the stealing of spaceships is being commanded from here. Bond then whips on a spacesuit so that he can stop the ship from going. <laughs> Moonraker. Moonraker. He gets caught, but I love how game he is to just go on the ship. Like, he has no idea what he's doing, but he's like, ah, why not? We then meet Blofeld. It seems like it's all over, but lucky him, Bond has a nicotine problem. And he uses the cigarette with a missile thing in it to blow up the guy who controls the dome of the volcano. Bond opens the volcano back up and all hell breaks loose. I really like how they use the set for the fight. They spend a solid five minutes of time just of the fight in the main set, and I'm glad they used that incredible area to the fullest. Meanwhile, Blofeld kills Osato, or the business guy for short, and as Blofeld is about to kill Bond, Tiger comes and saves the day. Bond then has a fight with the winner of the Red Grand Lookalike Contest. It's actually a pretty solid fight, and the score at this point is really matching to what is happening. Of course, Bond kills him with wit. Bon and stops the stealing of the shuttle by blowing it up, which begs the question of why you can do that. Anyways, Blofeld then blows up the entire volcano, which again begs the question, why is there a button that can blow up the entire volcano? Quinn, it's just a movie. Calm down. Anyways, Bond and his wife escape from the volcano, conveniently getting their own life raft, and make out into the next movie. A submarine picks him up, and that is when he lived twice.
You Only Live Twice is the fifth film for Sean Connery, and I think is the last classic Bond film that he made. Going into this film, You Only Live Twice is one of my least favorite Bond films. Actually, when I was around six-ish, I would say that this was my least favorite Bond film. Then again, Quantum Souls didn't exist, so there's that. But rewatching it now, I really enjoy You Only Live Twice. Connery isn't as awful as I remember him being, well, besides the plane scene, and all the MI6 characters are on top form in this movie. Although they may have been a tad bit better in the past, and they do improve in On Her Majesty's Secret Service, they are pretty solid here. The whole supporting cast are great, though. You know, you got Shane Rimmer, who I've talked about in the top 10 two-time characters. He was fantastic in the very small role that he was in. This is actually the first time that I noticed him in this film, but when I did, I remembered... He's actually pretty good. I liked him. I liked the Henderson character, played by Charles Gray. He was fantastic. Tiger was awesome. I know that's his code name, so don't flip a shit at me. But he was really great. The one person, the one person that I dislike in this film, though, is Aki. And I've talked about her in the past in my top ten, well, ranking of the Bond girls. And she was one of my least favorite because I just think... She's bland to begin with, but the way her character develops and goes through in this movie just makes no sense to me, and that's why she's one of my least favorite Bond girls. I know you guys probably disagree with me on that, it's just I don't really find anything great with her, and her character is so misused that I can't help but dislike her. We do gotta give the villains a little bit of love, though. Although Hans and number 11 were okay at best, if I had to compare number 11 to someone, it would probably be like a shitty Fiona Volpe. Blofeld, though is incredible, hands down the best villain in the entire series, which is saying a lot, because, you know, you got Trevelyan, you know, Scaramanga, you know, Zorin, you have all these fantastic villains, and the fact that he is the best one shows a lot about how just how great of a character he is, and he's acted so well that he's sort of, I wouldn't say likable, but he's really fun to watch. One thing I noticed throughout this film, though, is that this film really does take a lot of ideas and plot points from From Rush With Love, and that a solid few Roger Moore films, especially The Spy Love Me and Moonraker, take ideas from this film. Although I think that Diamonds Are Forever adds the comedy to the series, I really think that this is the true bridge to the Roger Moore era in terms of style of movie. Although I do think that this is the worst of Connery's performances, as a whole, it's not that bad. Although this film isn't incredible, I really had fun with it. If you have some time, check this film out. It's campy, it's a bit over the top, and it's a great reveal for Blofeld and what would have been a great exit for Connery. So what do you think of this film? Leave your answer in the comment section below, and as always, like, share, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time for On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Ciao.